my wife and I started dating uh, back in college. And so we were in college and we, uh, we started dating in December, early December, which was great timing for those that love to get gifts. Because when you start dating, you get gifts. And so uh, Christmas was just a few weeks away when we started dating. And so uh, as uh, someone who hates giving gifts because I'm really bad at it, I just get super stressed. I put it off. I put off the idea of getting the gift. I'll think about it later. I'll do it later. Uh, and so I just kind of put it in the back of my mind. Uh, I'll take care of that at some point. It's not a big deal. You know, it's our f- just our first, you know, <laughs> not significant at all. Um, it, meanwhile, my wife, Katie, uh, had a very different approach. She had been thinking about what she was going to get me for Christmas from before we started dating. Uh, I did not know this at the time. But she was listening to everything I said to find something that would be meaningful to me. In fact, she heard this one time me mention this specific movie that I said, and I quote, is my favorite movie of all time and there will be no other. And I will not tell you what the movie was because it's embarrassing. (laughs) But she heard me say that. And uh, so she decided that she was going to get me a copy of this movie. Now, this is the day before Amazon, before Prime Day, where you just look it up and order it, and it's on your doorstep the next day. No, you have to go hunt for the things that you want. So she goes from store to store to store to store to store, finally finds this movie. Meanwhile, I'm not thinking about gifts at all. (laughs) So she finds this movie, and along with the movie, she decides to get me a journal something that she loved to do that she found a lot of value in. She loved to, to journal a lot. And so uh, she was going to get me a journal. And in the journal, she wrote the first entry, something really sweet about how she adores me. She appreciates me. Just, uh, I really enjoy the time we get to spend together. This is going to be so much fun. Really, really sweet things. And then along with that, she gets a card. And the card explains the gift. She says, since we're going to be apart for just the oh-so-long period of time, six weeks on Christmas break, uh, I want you to take with you a piece of you, uh, the movie, and then a piece of me so you can remember. Sweet. Just, ah, that's so special. Well, I'll never forget whenever she decides to finally give me this gift, the day comes, she presents me this beautifully wrapped gift. I receive it, I open it, and I'm like, oh, thanks. Like, this is awesome, so sweet. And I I did what any uh, good boyfriend did in that moment. I lied. I told her, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't realize that we were giving gifts right now, you know, and so let me go up to my dorm and get your gift for you. The gift with which I had not purchased up to this point. (laughs) And so I go running up to my dorm room. I am scrambling looking for something to give her that has some some sense of like, I can hide that I didn't prepare, like she's not going to know. And so there I'm scanning my room and over along my closet, leaning on the door is the one. It was my old skateboard. (laughs) Yeah. Mind you, I had just gotten a new skateboard, so I had no use for the old skateboard. And so I'm like, this is perfect. I don't need it. It's in my dorm. She'll like it. It's a hobby we can do together. Guys, have you ever ever tried that one? Hey, come do this hobby that I love. Maybe you'll like it too. Uh, sometimes it works. Um, so I, I get the skateboard. Now, obviously, since I had not prepared the gift, I had no wrapping paper. And so I used the next best thing, my bed comforter. <laughs> so the blanket that I use every night, this is a true story, I promise. Uh, The blanket that I use every every night, I put that skateboard in, I wrap it, fold it up, march it outside, like, she's going to love this. And I really thought that. Uh, And she didn't. I'll just uh, go ahead and throw it out there. That was uh, no surprise for you. Now, needless to say, my gift did not meet expectations. I completely dropped the ball. Hadn't thought about it, hadn't considered it. I would like to say I've gotten slightly better at gift giving since then. She still did marry me. We were still married. Uh, But she spent all of this time preparing and looking for the perfect gift for me. 
And I just run in my dorm room and grab the first thing I see. So today I want to talk to those of you who might feel underappreciated, maybe undervalued, and occasionally even unseen. Those of you who feel taken for granted. We've been in a series called Summer Confessions. We've been walking through these different confessions uh, that we can find ourselves needing to give. And the purpose of Summer Confessions is to deal with areas of our life that God wants to work on in us to change the world around us. And this morning, as we get started, I want to confess to you that I take people for granted. And sometimes feel taken for granted myself. Because today I want to talk to those of you who give more, who serve more, who help more than anyone might know. And you do it because you're good hearted. You do it because you love people and you want to bless them. And let's be honest, even when you give with the purest heart, when you serve with the best intent, when you give out of the kindness of your heart every now and then, you occasionally want someone to acknowledge, to notice, to simply say thank you. Or perhaps in the situation with my wife, to reciprocate the effort that you are putting in. I want to talk to those of you who feel taken for granted. And when we consider these confessions we're making, the reason they are significant is because whatever pain you're facing, whatever challenge you are enduring, Jesus has been there. He has experienced the hardships that we have experienced. Jesus has experienced being taken for granted. He understands what it feels like. And so today, I want us to open up to Luke chapter 17. So if you have your Bible, you can open up to Luke chapter 17. We'll begin in verse 12, and we'll look at this uh, period of time where people took Jesus for granted and what he did as a result. Luke chapter 17, verse 12. And while he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him, and they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. We see these leprous men crying out at a distance, asking Jesus to help them. They know what he has done. They know what he has known for, that he is a person who has worked miracles. So they call out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Maybe you can relate to being called on on any and every circumstance. Perhaps you're the single person who all the people that you know ask you, can you babysit for us? Can you dog sit for us? Can you house sit for us? Can you plant sit for us? Yes, I said plant sit. How you sit a plant, I do not know. But people sometimes want their plants sat. Or perhaps you are the person with the truck. And so anytime someone needs to move something, you are called on. Or when you walk into your house at the end of a long day, as soon as you come through the door, you have a house full of people saying, I'm hungry, Where's, what's for dinner? Does that happen to you? Or it's 9.30 at night, you finally, finally get to sit down to relax for a moment. And then someone calls out, I have homework. Can you help me? Are you kidding me? Moms, dads, you know this well. Being called on on every circumstance. Completely underappreciated for all you do. You are the provider. You are the cook. You are the housekeeper, the Uber driver, the counselor, the doctor, the life coach, the personal shopper, the referee, the defense attorney the judge, and even when necessary, the executioner. <laughs> you have to do it all. And every now and then, you just want someone to look you in the eye and say, thank you. To say, hey, I notice. Thank you for picking me up for the 17th time in three days. 
Hey, I see how hard you've been working. Thank you for all that you do. I see as you come to work, you get in early, you leave late. I know it's been a crazy season. Thank you for all that you commit to do for our organization. Sometimes you just want someone to look you in the eye and say, thank you. And when we look in this story, we see the 10 lepers cry out, hey, Jesus, we're over here. We have leprosy, have mercy on us. And it continues. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, I want you to underline that. As they were going, they were cleansed. I love this. It's sometimes as you're doing what he has told you to do, that he actually shows up and does what it is you're asking him to do. As they were going, they were cleansed. Luke says they were cleansed, supernaturally healed from their leprosy. And then how many of them responded? It says, now one of them, mind you, we started with 10. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But the nine, where are they? This man, a Samaritan, a foreigner, And Jesus, the son of God, who needed zero affirmation from people because he had the approval of God, said, didn't I just heal 10 men? And has anyone seen the other nine? Completely taken for granted, they were healed supernaturally from a disease that outcasts you from everyone in society. The only people you can be around are other people with leprosy. He has supernaturally healed them and they just walk away like it never happened. And Jesus said, one, one came where are the nine? And I want you to consider this for your own life. Put yourself in Jesus' shoes. You get home after the long day of work and you start preparing dinner. And you prepare it, you get it ready, you sit down with your family, and your kids hardly eat anything. I'm full. And they run off. And then as you're doing the dishes, they have the audacity to come back and ask you for an applesauce. To ask you for a yogurt. To ask you for dessert. After they didn't eat anything that you had prepared, or maybe there's bad traffic stuck in traffic, and you just feel this movement of the Holy Spirit to finally let someone in. And you don't even get... <laughs> you, don't even, you don't even get the thank you wave. And then you, they drive past and you see a church story bumper sticker on the back of their car. <laughs> I'm never doing that again! We know that Jesus did not heal these lepers for selfish reasons, but even Jesus thought at least they could say thank you. So today I want to show you three statements to remember when you feel unseen, when you feel taken for granted, when you feel unappreciated. The first is how they make you feel is not who you are. How they make you feel is not who you are. I want you to remember that. Two, someone's inability to see your worth doesn't decrease your value. And the third is this. What's unseen by people is often what's most significant to God. So how they make you feel is not who you are. Someone's inability to see your worth doesn't decrease your value. And what's unseen by people is often what's most significant to God. Let's break those down one by one. How they make you feel is not who you are. Now, intellectually, we know that, right? But practically, we often tie their reaction to our identity. The way they react is how we feel about ourselves. If they show gratitude, we feel satisfaction. If they ignore us, we feel less than. But how they make you feel is not who you are. 
And I want to give you two very clear examples from the book of Luke, chapter four, a little bit earlier in Luke. Two examples in the same chapter of how people made Jesus feel. Two drastically different ways that they responded to the exact same thing that Jesus was saying and doing. In Luke chapter four, it says this in verse 15, and he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. He is speaking the word of God and the people are praising him for what he is saying. Ooh, that's good, Jesus. I'm writing that one down. Mmm. Mmm, powerful. Loving it. J-E-S-U-S. Yes. He is the king of me. I mean, they're cheering, right? They're praising who Jesus is and what he is saying. And then what happens after that? Not 13 verses later, we see this. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. So mind you, same synagogue, same people, same Jesus, same time frame. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage when, uh, as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city, led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. We love you, Jesus. We hate you. You're amazing. You suck. 13 verses later, a drastic different response. On one hand, we can experience people being so appreciative of what you're doing. And then in the next moment, it flips and they want to throw you off a cliff. Just night and day different. In one moment, you have the love and appreciation. And in the next, they attack you. Something flips in a moment. And they are no longer for you. They are against you. I'll give you an example. Just a, a week or two ago, my wife and I were at Chick-fil-A. We went with our daughters. We have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Play place for the win. And we uh, go to Chick-fil-A. And my daughter, Evelyn, she's four. Uh, she says, uppy. And then holds her hands up, which is her version of saying, will you pick me up? Uh, and so, of course, I, I pick her up. I'm holding her. And she leans her head on my shoulder and says, daddy, I love you. It's like, oh, I love you too, Evelyn. This sweet moment, I'm rocking her there. And I kid you not, within 10 seconds, I feel this sharp pain on my collarbone and she bit me. <laughs> what? You just said you loved me and then you bit me. A drastic different response. How they make you feel is not who you are. Why? I want you to write this down. Because you are who God says you are. God has already determined who you are, so other people can't. You are who God says you are. And Jeremiah chapter 1 says that God knew you before he formed you in your mother's womb. That you are chosen by God. You have been set apart, called by God, forgiven by Jesus, sealed by his Holy Spirit, adopted into the family of God. You are a joint heir. You are an ambassador. You are an overcomer. He calls you his masterpiece. And so how they make you feel is not who you are because you are who God says that you are. He has already determined that for you. We have to separate how they make you feel from who you really are. My lack of thought in giving Katie a gift had nothing to do with who she was. It had more to speak on who I was in the moment. It wasn't that she wasn't someone worthy of receiving a good gift, not a skateboard wrapped in a blanket, a dirty blanket. <laughs> How they make you feel is not who you are. Point two, someone's inability to see your worth doesn't decrease your value. I remember back in 2010, 2011, there was this new thing coming on the scene. And uh, I had a friend who was trying to convince me to buy it. I said, dude, I'm not spending real money on Monopoly money. 
It was something called Bitcoin. And it was going for about 10 to $20 at the time in 2011. And I said, dude, I'm not spending a hundred. He's like, just spend a hundred dollars. I'm not spending a hundred dollars on fake money. And uh, I wish I would have spent a little bit more than a hundred dollars on some fake money in 2011. But someone's inability to see your worth doesn't decrease your value. Just because they don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't, doesn't have value. We see this in the Old Testament. There's a time in Egypt, Pharaoh gets angry, the king of Egypt. He gets angry at his chief cupbearer, the one that's supposed to sample the drink before the Pharaoh drinks it to make sure it doesn't have poison in it. And so he's mad at the cupbearer, so he throws him in prison. While he's in prison, the cupbearer has a dream. The stream that he's unsure of what it means. Well, while he is in prison, he meets this guy named Joseph. And Joseph is in prison for his own reasons, not of his doing. But Joseph is there and he offers to interpret the cupbearer's dream. He offers to help him. He says that in three days, Pharaoh will restore you to your role. And Joseph says this to the cupbearer. Essentially, now that I have helped you, Please do this for me. We see it in Genesis chapter 40. It says, only keep me in mind when it goes well with you. And please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, as I've done nothing that they should have put me in this dungeon. Hey, help me out. And what does the cupbearer do? Verse 23. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And he didn't just forget him for a day, two days, a week, a month. For two years, Joseph is stuck in prison wrongfully. And he is forgotten by the cupbearer who never gave him another thought. Someone's inability to see your worth doesn't decrease your value. The cupbearer did not see the worth in Joseph past what Joseph had done for him. And can't we relate? You do something, you go out of the kindness of your heart, you go above and beyond giving to someone. And once they receive what they needed, they discard you like trash. You feel strongly to proclaim truth to someone that is overseeing you, a supervisor, and it falls on deaf ears. Or perhaps you did the work, you did all the work and someone else received the benefit and then they just brush you to the side. You've been working so hard trying to provide so much value to this organization and they don't notice, they don't even see your worth. I'll say it again, someone's inability to see your worth doesn't decrease your value. Why? Because your value is determined by a God who sees. Who sees you in the moments that no one else sees. Who notices you who sees you get up before everyone else in your family to get everything set. Something they don't even realize is happening. They just think it's a normal part of what you do. We have a father who sees and our value is determined by a God who sees. So how they make you feel is not who you are. Someone's inability to see your worth doesn't decrease your value. And third, what's unseen by people is often what's most significant to God. And unfortunately, the world's culture is pretty opposite of that, right? People celebrate what they see. They don't celebrate what they don't see. It makes sense, right? You can't celebrate what you can't see. They'll congratulate you on graduating because they see you walk across the stage. They'll congratulate you on the promotion that you received at work because they saw it on your social media feed. They'll congratulate you on the house that you just bought because they know that you've been searching for the perfect house and you finally found the one, but someone will not congratulate you on strengthening your character. And isn't that more important? What's unseen by people is often what's most significant to God. They may not congratulate you on overcoming an addiction because they didn't know about it. It's not a matter of how they view you. It's a matter of how God views you. 
and the significance of the things that are unseen. I'll say it this way. What's invisible is often what's most valuable. What's invisible is often what's most valuable. It's not about what everyone else sees. And I love it that you see Jesus say very directly in Matthew chapter six, it says this, it says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward with your father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound trumpets before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. So they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. Continues. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right is doing so that your giving will be in secret. And your father who sees, underline that, your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When we give to others, when we are serving others, it's not for their recognition. It's for the glory of God. We're not doing what we are doing to be seen by others, but knowing that we have a father who sees, who sees what you are doing, who sees the motives of your heart, the things that you do in secret, the effort that you put in when no one is looking, the hard work that you've been doing on your marriage, that maybe even your spouse isn't fully appreciating just yet. You have a father who sees. In fact, God is called in the Old Testament, El Roi, which is the God who sees. El Roi, the God who sees. We see in Genesis chapter 16, flip there. Genesis chapter 16, we hear about this woman named Hagar. And Hagar is the Egyptian maidservant of this woman named Sarah, who's the wife of Abram, who becomes Abraham. And Sarah tells Abram that because she can't bear him a son, to have a son with Hagar. Simple, right? I can't have a son, so have a son with Hagar, so that way we can have a family. And so Abram does just that. And Hagar gets pregnant. And then what we see is that as a result of Hagar getting pregnant, even though it was Sarah's idea, she despises Hagar. Hagar did nothing wrong. She did what she was told to do, what she was forced to do. The words exactly are treats her harshly for no reason at all. Sarah, who had the idea, despises her. So Hagar flees. And as Hagar flees, the Lord seeks her out. She didn't do anything wrong, but the Lord seeks her, finds her, the God who sees. And it says this in Genesis chapter 16, starting in verse nine. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that there will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her further, behold, you are with child and you will bear a son. You will call his name Ishmael because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east with his brothers. And then she called on the name of the Lord who spoke to her, El Roi. You are a God who sees. For she said, have I even remained alive here after seeing him? Hagar discarded by everyone around her despised even by the actions of another. Completely taken for granted. Abused, used, unseen, unappreciated of her sacrifice, of what she was doing. Flees because she can't face these people who are saying she 
has no worth. But I'll remind you, how they make you feel is not who you are. And someone's inability to see your worth does not decrease your value because you have a God who sees, who sees you right now in the difficulty you're walking through. No one understands the depths of what you're facing the pain that you're experiencing, the hurt that you just went through. But you have a God who sees, takes heed of your affliction, who cares, who notices. A father who sees when you get up early and you serve behind the scenes. A father who sees when you do the right thing, when it would be so much easier to just cut corners and compromise your integrity. A father who sees you go behind your kid and pick up and clean up after them again and again and again and again and again. You have a father who sees, sees the effort that you're putting in. When you cry out to him, begging him for provision, asking him for healing, asking him to restore a relationship, you have a father who sees your effort because the effort we put in is not for the recognition of people. We know that we have a father who sees, who notices what you are doing, who has called you by name. And regardless of how someone makes you feel, you have a father who sees you, who says you have value, you have worth. Scriptures say this in Hebrews. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name and having ministered and still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope in the end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. That God sees your efforts that what you hope for may be given to you. In Luke 17, Jesus heals 10 and only one came back. And what did Jesus do as response? If you read on, he doesn't say, they didn't appreciate me, so I'm not healing anyone else. That was it. No. You read on, he says, let me tell you about the kingdom of God. He says this in verse 18. Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered and he said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And he says, I am going to suffer and I am going to die. I'm going to put my life on the line for you. You who did not say thank you. You who did not appreciate me. Who do not understand the depth of my sacrifice for you. He says, I am going to do this for you. He didn't let people's response deter him from the mission that God had given him. Don't let people define you to tell you what you're worth. Don't let the way they make you feel dictate how you view yourself. It doesn't matter what any other person tells you about yourself. It matters what God says about you. And he says you are loved. And he sees what you're going through. He understands. He cares. Our response to this is to take a moment to realize even when we are taken for granted that we really do have a father who sees. And he'll be with you. Even when you're not sure 
when you don't know what to expect. A father who sees. Let's pray.